Our first topic, Todd, is inspired by this quote right here. What do you think? Now, I actually describe authenticity as, as like the number one aspirational goal. And I often tell audiences like this that, uh, that, that you know, that, that's, that's the thing that you're after. But then I started to think about this. I do get better at it. I mean, the more I do it, the more I feel like I can express authenticity to an audience. So what does that make me? Am I a phony? Because I can actually practice it and get it better. Maybe George Burns is right. Maybe he was on to something. And, uh, and I want to put this to the group. You know, we, we talk about authenticity as being, as, as being, in some cases, the most important quality that a presenter can have. I don't know. Is it? Who are we going to first on this one? Give it up, Sally. Okay, uh, I say yes. It is the most important quality that a speaker can have. But I, I don't think you can fake it. So I'm, I'm trying to, right now, like Zen um, with Doug earlier, when he said, like, get in touch with your anger. I'm going to try and, like, get really uh, angry about this. Because, because uh, when somebody, for instance, uh, says that they're humble, right, it doesn't make them humble. Saying it doesn't make it so. so saying it doesn't make it, so, make it so. Practicing, I, I don't think, helps you fake it better. I think it just helps you retrain your body and retrain yourself so that you feel comfortable in the moment and you are you are able to let go and really uh, actually find an authentic connection. So practice can make perfect, but practice doesn't mean that you weren't doing it before. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, that's, you know, because I ask myself, am I a hypocrite because I'm practicing it and I'm getting better? Well, that means that I wasn't before. And, and you see, this is my dilemma. Carmen, what do you think? Well, think about it this way, and this is, turns into a practical advice. You're told to be yourself. Be yourself. You hear that often, and that's linked to authenticity. Your mother may have told you, be your best self. <coughs> Has your mother ever said that? From a presentation standpoint, I would advertise, be your best self in the service of your audience. Because ultimately, it's not so much how much authentic authenticity you display, but does that authenticity serve your audience well? And I think the strength of this quote, especially as you only show the first word, is not in the word sincerity, but rather in the period after. At what point do you stop? How we're, much? We're going to parse this all the way down how to, much to the punctuation. Huh? So exactly. So you know, because you know, sometimes your authenticity might be in the in the subtle lines. So imagine this. As you're investigating your own authenticity and who you are, what is yourself and what is your best self, I really like this other quote that says, I am a tiger in search of a cage. Think about that for a moment. That's, the, it's weird. That's pretty deep. <laughs> it's weird. Well, it's weird because authenticity is one thing. Authenticity in the service of your audience. Are you the tiger who is willing to accept the cage so that you're authentic, but only as long as it serves your audience? Mm -hmm. No one? Let's... Hello. Let's turn that down a bit. Let's um, split it into two things. Authenticity of message or authenticity of delivery. So I would say authenticity of message is important because if you're not, basically you're lying. Like if I didn't believe in exercising and I got out here and I said, oh, you shouldn't go to the gym every day, that would be inauthentic. But I think I have to put on some sort of maybe inauthentic persona when it comes to delivery. Because if I spoke, every time I got up to speak, if I acted the way I did at a party, I'd probably be off in the corner by myself talking to one person. So when it comes to delivery, I think, you know, that's where you become an actor. That's where you do things that are not ingrained in you. And I think that's okay. So you're separating yeah. the, the message from the delivery. That's a very interesting takeaway. So, yeah, it's interesting because I, I have an acting background. And so as a presentation coach, it's often 
uh, I tap into that. So I remember certain roles that I took on that, that I didn't click with that character right until I put on a certain pair of shoes or whatever. It was like suddenly I could become that character more. But of course the whole goal as an actor is to find yourself in that character. And I think that's where the authenticity and delivery comes in. Because uh, yes, you could get good at, at being like, you know, Mr. Crowd person if you're not that somebody. Right? But, but there's a way that you would do that that is going to be different from somebody else. And that's where the authenticity piece comes in. Like what, what I tell my clients is, you know, who feel this out of body experience. That's how they explain it. It can often feel like I, I suddenly you don't know what to do with your hands. And you know, it, it, it freaks the body out a little bit. And so what I try and tell them is like, I want this to feel like you, but like dial up a notch or two so that it's still uh, in their gut is like, yes, this is me. And he up you. Yeah, just just enough so that the people in the back of the room can hear you and it's clear and uh, you're projecting confidence and all of the things that we want it to be, but still you. Who has thoughts on this? Who wants to, who wants to participate? Yes. I'm kind of confused. So, to me, authenticity... That's one of our goals. That's okay. <laughs> to be confused. Because to me, authenticity is being more transparent. So, to me, authenticity would be no one being who he is, not being who he is. Authenticity is being transparent. Right. And, so, and be, so you're not able to reconcile these. Not, not being off in the corner. Not being off in the corner, but being more who you are yeah. and not who you are. Yeah. So what, what do you think about how Sally described it, that it's an amped up you? Is, is that being transparent or is that being fake? I guess if he wants to be a speaker, then, I mean, I guess he needs to be able to speak in front of people, but I think I'd rather him still have his own personality. Totally. I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I think there's, there's more room in terms of the spectrum of what a speaker is than what we think. And so many times we're like, oh, a speaker is this, and they've got to be you know, confident and walk like this and be like this. And I think that's it's bullshit. OK? <laughs> See, I like stepped away from that a little bit. I think our, the spectrum of speaker is really, really wide. And so if somebody, I've, I just recently I saw a big talk last week. This woman uh, was really nervous. And you could tell, but the way that she handled it in that moment and was so open with us about it, it was in service to the audience. And so we were totally on her side and cheering for her. And it was this beautiful, it created this really beautiful connection. I'm pretty sure that Nolan wouldn't get the fours and fives that he gets and the crowds that he gets if he wasn't being himself. Anybody else? Yes, Heather, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. Authentic. You want to split? You want to uh, distinguish? Split hairs. getting pretty deep. What do you think, Andrea? Yeah. I think that if your message is relevant to your audience, so if you're speaking to me and what you're speaking about means something to me and is going to benefit me, um, and if you feel passion for it in your own way, then you can be up there whispering, and as long as I can still hear you, I'm still going to be engaged because you believe what you're saying and what you're saying is relevant to me. So I, I don't need the bells and whistles and all of the fake persona yeah and so now we're going to introduce another term passion because if you believe it then and your audience can feel your passion it, and it can be a quiet passion it yeah. doesn't need to be right. top. You just have to <laughs> okay very good we're going to switch topics but we might come back to this if necessary so our next one carmen kicked up talk next one <laughs> carmen kicked up quite a firestorm uh monday morning uh by Essentially, putting storytelling on trial—at least the way that I that I, that I interpreted it—you know, because we've heard a picture is worth a thousand words, but can words themselves be memorable? 
are we really visual people the way we've heard so many presenters tell us so? And who wants to go first here? I think it's you, Carmen. I, I could go first. So we we're talking about uh, visuals, and physiologically speaking, we are visual beings. 60 to 70 percent of our work with um, receptors, body receptors, to which we take in the world, are visuals. So that's why you cannot go wrong with displaying your messages through visuals. But where do those visuals come from, and what is the format? That's a deeper question I can ask because. Words can be just as memorable as pictures if they enable our brains to form a mental image. So if I invited you to think, what would you all look like if you had a third eye in the middle of your forehead? Notice how I don't have to show you a PowerPoint slide to enable you to picture that image. So words can be as effective as pictures if they, if they enable the audience to form a that mental. picture in their yes. head. Nolan can words as effectively do you think that they can as effectively form that picture in the head? Well, I think you have to get down to the type of image because we're all like image crazy and you know the, the big stock, you know, metaphoric photo of the kid at the lemonade stand, because I want to talk about sales. So I always talk about the difference between metaphoric imagery and literal imagery. Mm -hmm. And I think metaphoric imagery, while it might be beautiful and in the moment be, you know, more clever or more designy, I don't think that has staying power because somebody's gonna walk away and they're gonna they're gonna remember lemonade and not widgets. You've always been the saying. advocate for the, yeah. for the literal so, photo. I would love, you're talking about your sales team, show me a photo of your sales team. Now, in that world, ideally, it's a memorable photo of your sales team doing something literal um, as opposed to, you know, the puzzle pieces or the, you know, the, the, the runners, you know, handing off the baton. Because that, it's not literal, it is. There's a difference, though, between metaphors and metaphors. So there are some that have been so overly used, yeah. you say. Like, what are some of your pet peeves? Like mine, if I never see that iceberg picture in a presentation ever again, <laughs> that would be just fine with me. Do you have any of yours? Like, what are your Oh, Julie, the mountain climbing. The mountain climbing, yeah. The person yeah. is, yeah. they actually have a laptop at the top of the, yeah. of the mountain. For me, it's the guy crossing the finish line in a suit in a briefcase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Two hands of the earth in the middle. Two hands of the earth in the yeah. middle. I like that one. Arrow, yeah. arrow bullseye in the target. Yes. And Nolan, this is what you're referring to. These are all metaphorical photos right. that... And, and they're cliche. And they're but let's ask the opposite question. What are some fresh metaphors that you've heard recently? Because we can all learn from you. Surely there's something that you've heard recently where you thought, that is a unique way of putting this. Yeah, go for it. So, I well, we have a lot of metaphors. And I think that Photos that, that covered an entire lifespan. Yeah, just uh, the metaphorical example of the full demographic that we heard from the Sally, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love words, and I think words are incredibly powerful. To me, if you are using an image, it's to highlight the word, right? Or words, or the, that sort of feeling around it. So, I. I to me, they're, they're a beautiful pair together and necessary. They amplify each other. So true. Since we're talking about metaphors, mm -hmm. let's consider this metaphor. Since we're talking about words and images, I usually advise people to look at them as two ladders. And when you have climbed up one, then go and climb up the other. Because neither one of them is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the brain needs the variety between the two. Because after a while, even pictures will be forgotten because the brain habituates so darn fast. So just the switch from one element to another will create an extra uh, amount of attention and therefore an extra chance of memory. Ask a question. So we've already gone through one day of, of, se of sessions. From yesterday, and I'll answer it first, who can think of an image that they saw on the screen that they remember today? And let me tell you mine, the one that, that comes to mind. It's Mike Parkinson's childhood photo. Yeah. Oh, that's, conscious? Yeah, that's what I remember because that, well, for a lot of reasons, which Carmen would probably agree with. But, um, <laughs> uh, Beverly? Which one is yours? You know, I'm just the opposite because what I remember yesterday was my picture before your picture of Jen's and Mike's story. 
And I remember that all night, and I remember in your second seminar where you said, never make your last slide a thank you. And you didn't have a slide for that because the red police came in and got you. But <laughs> they knocked you off. So I think that really great presenters have to be able to present without visuals and be able to take those words. And I can tell you, there have been more times than not that I've gone into a courtroom with two months of work and an opening statement for a, an attorney to have a judge say, we're not allowing any visuals. Okay? He's still got people that he's got to portray the story of why we're in that courtroom. So, you know, yesterday, unfortunately, I can't tell you any of your visuals, but I can tell you the story you painted for me with your words. So for me, it's important to separate the venues. I, I think words are tremendously effective when they are spoken. And when you blend them with evocative and literal and effective visuals, then I think you create something that is better than the sum of the parts. Yeah, and especially the other thing about this, if you put up an image and there are no words that are paired up with that image, now you're placing more pressure on the audience to come up with their own words. And, and you use the word pressure, I think, pressure. You mean that in a healthy way. In a, he in a healthy way, because ultimately, what do people remember more of? What you said or what they thought? <laughs> just like in, uh, in the example we just heard. Thank you for that. I, um, for some reason, really remember Carmen, your fire breathing dragon. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was just because it was so unexpected for imagery, as we're talking about like stock that we see all the time. I think that fire breathing dragon was just so different. But do you remember what she was trying to say with the fire? This breathing? is actually along with your study, right? So <laughs> what I think I remember is that um, you were covering up the words, and that um, yeah, that's all I remember was covering up the words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talking about myths and we're just demystifying them with science, but I'm so glad that that image stood out. Thank you. Okay, um, what I was thinking is that for most of the presenters that I know, they are not good presenters. And so it's the point of working with people who are not good presenters so that words on the screen, I think, are very good when they're because they can be very artistic. And some words, like if I pull out the word images there, I mean, just the word itself can look good, you know, and use that word itself as an image because most people are not good presenters. And that's the whole point of having the PowerPoint is that they can be better presenters. And, and, and a single word can be as effective as an image. Yes. Yeah. One more, Jody. <clears throat> This was uh, Carmen's, it was very unexpected. It was a line drawing that all of a sudden there was this zen moment for me when the, when the vine, the actual photograph of a green vine comes out. It was just almost magical. I can't even explain it. I was like, oh, because I don't know if it was because it was unexpected or just because it was pretty. I don't know, but it made, it really made an impact on me. And it was about an embellishment, wasn't Thank, it? Yeah, it was. So I'm glad that you remember the idea. So yeah. the practical guideline for all of us, and, and we're learning from you, is treat all of these elements that you have in your inventory, images, text, lines, shapes, from the standpoint of variety. Because if I had had those vines on 10 slides, they would have lost their impact. If I had had words on 10 slides after a while, they lose that impact. But the more that you vary the stimulus for the brain, the longer you can sustain attention, and therefore you have a chance at memory. Okay. Uh, one, one last thing. I, I saw a photo this morning, so it wasn't yesterday, but this morning, of uh, an image that served as a visual bumper sticker that for me encapsulated the whole message of somebody's presentation for me when I think about it, you know, weeks or months from now. And that was Caleb this morning, had a photo up for a long time of him and, and uh, Schwarzenegger, yeah. right? And to me, and if that, I met the guy, I'd probably keep it up there for right. a long time, too. But that would be the only uh, visual that I remember from that presentation, but it also encapsulates everything about, to me, um, that talk. Um, and I always talk about having a, a little bumper sticker in a presentation. If you can put your whole message into four words that people can take away, like apples, a thousand songs in your pocket. You know, with, so if you can do it with a visual, and it's incredibly difficult, and I think a lot of times it's probably unintentional, but... I think that would be ideal if you can, yeah, if you can get one iconic image. All right, next topic. Right here. We all do it. 
Some are more noticeable than others. Mine's okay. I say okay. That's how I start. That's my transition from one thought to another. I say okay. Some coaches hate them. Some coaches spend hours trying to coach it out of people. And, um, and others, uh, others actually advocate for it because they, they feel that, that it would paralyze somebody if they tried to, to try to untrain them of this, these verbal tics. And um, I, I, it, it actually it makes for a fascinating discussion. At least I hope it's going to. <laughs> Sally, start us off. Yeah, so I am here to defend the filler words to uh, a greater degree than I know most presentation coaches do. And that is because when I talk with audiences about what is impactful, what is what do you find to be moving, of course the word that they're looking for is authentic, right? Mm -hmm. And conversational. And we hear all these things they want to feel like we're just you hanging out, you and me, right? So when uh, when speakers are so focused on getting rid of their filler words, what I have found is they're, they're missing some of the other really essential elements that make for a connected, authentic presentation. Too many filler words is a bad thing. When it becomes distracting, that's a problem. But that, to me, is the only bar. Some filler words in there, you're okay. I just, I've, I've met so many speakers who are like, when I start working with them, they're like, just so you know, I don't use filler words. Just and so like, you know. Just, like, just so you know. Like, I'm really, 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 you know, they're so proud of themselves because they don't use filler words. And I'm like, great, but let's have a conversation about this really bad content. You know? Like, <laughs> or, or they're just not super interesting up on their feet yet. So I just think it misses the point and it becomes the scapegoat for bad presenting. Nolan, does that miss the point? I don't know. Don't people use filler words because they are trying because they don't feel authentic because they're trying to because you know because the same people won't use them in conversation but the moment you get them up on stage and they feel this terror of silence this terror where they wouldn't in a conversation so are they using filler words because they are because they're they're not authentic i don't know i'm, no. I'm just that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's because they're not authentic. It because could they're... be because they're nervous, right? But you can be nervous and authentic at the same time. I just, I think that the, most of the time, we in conversation use filler words to such a degree that we don't notice it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so if that transfers up on stage and we don't notice it, no problem. Do you, think, do you think the average person uses the same amount of filler words in conversation as they do up on, up on stage? I don't, that's a great question. My gut is that there's, there's some degree of difference, but not unless I notice that difference. Because I personally, you know, I haven't done studies, but I, yeah. I, I think people use a lot more when they get up to speak, which to me tells, tells me they're overcompensating and we have to get back to being casual. So if I see those filler words, I'm like, you're trying really hard and you're no longer authentic if we're going to stay on that word. I don't and think so it's nerves. And in fact, I, I don't, I'm not even sure that, it's, that they're filler words. I find so often that people just need to get their brains jump-started, that, that it's just sort of the, the rhythm of, of their thoughts. And there's one in particular that really fascinates me, and you will hear this all the time now. Just about any interview starts with two words. And so. No, that's not the words I'm looking for. I mean. I mean. Anderson Cooper does it all the time. He starts by saying, I mean. I can understand if you're saying, well, what I'm really trying to say is, and it's almost like their brain has already started, and they have to catch their, I mean, it, it, you'll see it now. If you, have, if you haven't already noticed it, you can say, oh, damn, that all, and he's right. Everybody <laughs> starts with this. <laughs> and, and, and while, yes, it could be a, an issue if it, um, if it becomes excessive, jump-starting your brain is important. But we, we, we exchanged an email about this, and Nolan brought up a really good example of a time when it's undercutting your credibility. And that happens. This is, this is a serious, real deal. So would you want to share the example you were talking about? Do you remember? Uh, a college student. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, we were watching TV a few days ago, and there was this college student asking a question of a politician, a congressman. And he started off very well-spoken and 
And I and he started asking a question. I actually, you know, was about to look to my wife and say, "This guy, this guy should run for office." But then he started going into the ums and the ums and the, the likes as he got farther into his question, and it was unbelievably distracting. And it also start. I started to say, "Yeah, he's got some time before he runs for office." All right. And so this was this was on television. Yeah, it was. Just, <laughs> yeah, it was, just, like, it was a college student in the audience. Yeah, yeah something like okay. that. Okay. So yeah, it was unbelievably distracting. Yeah, that's um, a problem. Where he started off is incredibly well spoken. And all that. So to me, and look, maybe this is just a technical thing. I was I was a, a, a theater director, so we all know about the technical things mm -hmm. that you simply have to make work. Like, yeah, okay, be authentic and everything, but face the audience. Like that's the that's a technical thing. You just move this and way. Context matters greatly, of course. So when you're on TV and this is a high pressure moment, you're trying to build credibility. These are all moments where ideally you're not fumbling around, right? But most of us don't present in that scenario. Most of us are in a much lower stakes workshop scenario. And in that context, I think there's more room for us to be more of our human selves. I'd, I'd like Carmen's take on this because yeah. you know what, in, okay, so how, we, how long have we known each other? Atlanta, 2009, <coughs> right? I think that was the first time, so eight years ago and I'm not sure she's ever said one um or one uh in all of that time. Now, I'm not really sure that I'm paying her a compliment with that. I, I just don't know. I, I mean, I think that, see, I just said it. I just said it. That as often as just the way that people convey what they're thinking and, and that they're thinking about something and that they're searching for that word. I mean, you're just so articulate, you never need to search for a word. You ever do it on purpose? <laughs> well, just if we were to look at authenticity as we talked about, if we were to look at memorability, if we were to look at, look at verbal tics, regard them on a spectrum because too many of them and it's unpalatable for the audience. Too few and we're now flirting with the robotic world, which we're getting close to anyway. I'm actually curious as we're teaching these chatbots to speak in our place, are we going to teach them to say um or ah? Uh? To make it more real. Exactly. Yeah. Are we preserving our humanity in some of these little quirks that some of us have? I mean... When will Siri use filler words? <laughs> yes, yes. Go for it. And I, and I shudder every time I listen to it and hear my say, myself saying, oh. So, do you really? You do? I do. Because it jumps out. Get to over me. it. To you. <laughs> to me. To you. Right, to what me. I'd be curious is if it jumps out to your audience. Uh -huh. notice, now they find it. There's a little compliment. Yes, no? Yeah. no? Okay, good. So with that Q&A portion, if, you, if, if there's a question that's being asked, or if someone asks a question of you, and you do need time to think, there's a bit of a pause. To your listeners who are there, if you're not editing that pause out, or if there's a conversation or a lull, for those listeners, that pause, yeah. that pause <laughs> yeah. you need to fill it. It's right. It's so e true. even just from like a that bit of accessibility, yeah. you know, you need something there. Now, and Sally, you you produce yours. You, you, you're not just linear from start to finish. And so, do you do do you edit out? Well, well pauses. I do you been, edit out uns and ums? There have been a few guests who have been uh, so distracted with their verbal tics or filler words, so much so that I felt I needed to because we were missing the message. Mm -hmm. So, in service to my audience, I did edit some of those out, but I really try not to. Part with a lot of time. So it really <laughs> takes a lot of time. She brought up a similar um, point that I wanted to make about the ums and ahs when you're speaking in public. And I think as a newbie speaker, I've never been coached. I probably should work with Sally. <laughs> when a speaker uses ums and ahs in their speech and you can tell that they're new to it, I think it's because they feel like they can't pause. And they can't, white space is good in design. That pause and that quiet space is great when you're up on stage too. And so as, as a new speaker, you might not know that. No one has ever told you that. 
And by saying um and ah while you're waiting for your next thought to be fully formed in your mind before it comes out of your mouth, I think that it's just because the speaker doesn't know that they can be quiet for a second. I, I like that. And in fact, one of the best uh, pieces of advice that you hear for fixing the ums and ahs is to replace it with a pause. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because after all, silence is the essence of music, and what you're saying is silence is the essence of speaking. Wonderful. The challenge is most of us aren't even aware of our own yes. fillers. We're not even aware of our own tendencies and verbal tics and all of the little things that we add in again and again. So until you have the courage to listen to yourself or watch yourself, which is so hard and can be excruciating, then you know we're sort of ignorance is bliss on that. But that's why it's helpful to have. It's funny. Nolan and I have both become quite aware of our own. Um, I've made peace with mine, and you haven't. Be up on No, no, it's just the opposite. You deserve absolution. <laughs> All right. Kim told me it wasn't a problem, so it's not it's a problem. It's not a problem. Okay. No. Okay, so technology was supposed to make our lives simpler. I've been hearing that for well over a decade now, and I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. We are always, always on. And you know, today, in, in like, we can work at any time. And isn't that great? Or does that suck? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, it hasn't made my life simpler. It maybe has made my life more exciting. I'm certainly more effective, but um, and, and I'm, uh, all, all this extra time that I'm supposed to have, I don't know, I'm usually filled it with work. And, uh, and I want to start with Nolan here because he's just had a tremendous life change. As many of you know, he's a new dad. Yay. He's a new dad to twins. It's a miracle that he's here. 12 weeks? 12 weeks, yeah. And uh, so, Nolan, start us off here with this always-on, 24-7 life that we've been leading. So I was, on a, I was a guest on a podcast called the Freelance Transformation Podcast. Does anyone know it? Did, okay, I think Troy may have turned me on to it. So it's pretty good. It's a guy in Canada. Every, every week or every other week, he has a, a different freelancer. If somebody owns their own business or you know, left the uh, working for the man type thing. And at some, at, it was a good conversation, but at some point, I, I said something like, Oh, I, I keep both my I have two separate email addresses, one for personal, one for business, but I combine the, the, the inboxes on my phone, which is great because I can you know, always see whatever. And he, he, I could hear, hear him shudder and he said, oh no, oh no, you have to separate everything and we're going to have a conversation offline about that. You have to. I mean, he was really into this. There's work and there's you know, your personal and I work nine to five and then I, I turn off. And I really, we didn't get into it, but I really disagreed because, I mean, one, one of the things people, you know, there are lots of sayings about working for yourself, like, um, you know, I left, I left working the, uh, 40 hours at the company, so I could work 80 hours, you know, for myself, or, you know, I choose which 80 hours a week to work, yeah. so, right? And, and I think that, that's the bigger thing for me. So I can choose which hours to work. So in the middle of a Wednesday afternoon, I can go for a two-hour bike ride or I can take my kids to the doctor, or I can you know, not have to be at my desk at 9 a.m. because I'll, I'll work an extra you know, hour later tonight or over the weekend. So for me, having that always on allows me to fit the life I want to live in, you know, make that path, and fit working around it. Now, if you have a boss and they are dictating that you're working on Saturday night or whatever, I think that's a whole different thing. But for me, working for myself, it, it, it's, I don't want, I don't want 40 hours a week, you know, nine to five. That would be killer. Um, yeah, for, for me, I go back to the concept of resentment. Because when I'm working 80 hours, I rarely resent it. But if, and, and I have to acknowledge here, we have three self-employed, four self-employed individuals in front of the room. Most of you, though, have employers. I believe that's the demographic. Most of you have employers. And if you work 80 hours a week for your boss, you probably end up resenting it. If we resent our work, we have to retire, or we have to quit, we have to change jobs. So, so there is a bit of a disconnect there. What do you two think? Carmen? I would approach it from how much cognitive energy there is left in the brain to process the messages that you have for your audience, because they're not going to be any different. They too will have to manage some priorities like we heard this morning. They only have this many hours in the week, and you still have a message to tell them, and they should remember it. So just know that through the day, we expand, expand so much cognitive energy that as it gets later and later in the day, we have much less of it. 
So then you are a choreographer of your audience's brain's energy. That's why I don't really like to even use the word passion, because what is passion really but the amount of energy that your brain has in order to get you to move towards a desirable goal. So from that angle, how do you manage the energy that's left in your audience's brains? Because even after a conference like this, like if you were to go back to your hotel room and you've learned a lot and you've expanded and you've given us so much, what do you reach for, the broccoli or the chocolate? <laughs> I was like, what is but how do you do? You don't really manage yeah. time, you're managing energy, people's energy. Do they have enough energy left after 40 hours, after 80 hours to listen to your message and process it in such a way that they are... I had the feeling this might go in many directions. I did not anticipate broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> well, what you're talking about is discipline. So when Nolan talks about, I could go take a bike ride in the middle of the two hour bike ride, I'm like, yes, I could do that, couldn't I? Uh, but I don't, right? Because I'm I'm feeling, I myself, like I'm feeling the overwhelm of always on. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is overwhelming because it is on me and there's so much I want to do and I'm, and I'm a driven person and I have three kids and they have so many needs and it's like, it, it's, do you see the crazy face I'm making? <laughs> <laughs> so it is about, to what both of you are saying, it's about discipline and choosing and I gotta work on that. I mean, I'll still, I'll still midway through the ride check my phone, and if there's a client emergency, I'll respond to it. But that's two minutes, and then I'm back. The answer is golf. <laughs> For four hours, my phone is off. If you're intrigued by how the brain processes information and has enough energy to process to, to remember it, check out this concept that's called ego depletion, which simply means that from your audience's perspective. As they lose cognitive energy, they're going to be less and less open to your messages. So as they two have twins, as they two have the, and make probably crazy equally face. crazy faces, yeah. how are they going to listen to you and add yet one more component to what's already happening in there? That's why it's no wonder that we revert to habits whenever we are exposed to new information, because what's easier, to engage in change or to revert to that which you have done for quite some time? Yeah. Okay, last topic. This dude here has, uh, is, is, is reading his speech. And for him, the alternative would be to memorize his speech. Okay, so one word, start at this side of the audience. Should you memorize your speech? Yeah. Should you memorize your speech? No. 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 Carmen, should you memorize your speech? Yes. <laughs> So this is really actually a fascinating discussion, I feel, because um, you know actors they have to learn their lines, and you know actors, a good actor, think he's as authentic as sincere as can be, and um, and yet you've heard this from everybody, and and sure, I mean, we all would agree that you don't want that, and that if somebody is up for thank you very much for having me today, I'm going to you know it's just it's, you can tell you can tell when somebody has memorized and rehearsed too much. And yet, there is a body of thought that, that, that argues in favor of that, and Carmen is going to represent it. I am, just like we were talking, again, authenticity, memorability, verbal takes. Now we're talking about memorizing text. Look at, actually, here, there's a, meta, a metaphor, and we're going to add some metadata on top of it, because we're going to analyze it. So imagine your presentations as a clothesline, and you have the ability to cover it in percentages, in, in ratios too much memorization and you are going to come across as, uh, as a robot. Have you ever seen those bunny speaking? Uh, it's, it's, it's coming across like that, not in the service of your audience. But not enough memorization and you are doing your audience a disservice because have you ever been in a circumstance where you didn't practice, you didn't memorize, and you walked out of the room and you thought, I should have said this, I should have said that, and I should have said this other thing. Not only that, but I should have said it this way. For the presentation yesterday, I memorized a few spots because if I didn't get Jen's story right, I would have forgotten the fact that she was wearing the types of shorts and the, the color of her shirt and how the bench was. I had to go over those details. Actually, in the shower, thing, Jen never forgot the day that she met Mike. Okay, she was wearing um, jean shorts and she had the line. <laughs> those details have to come across just so because then I'm not doing your service because I'm not coherent in how I'm transitioning to the next part. And here's one. Reminder, what is memory 
but an association between two concepts. So memorization helps you make the associations for your audiences so that they understand what it is that you're talking about. Yeah. Carl, remember, there's a difference between memorizing the whole speech yeah, and yeah, key yeah, points. Yeah, and yeah. I, I would agree with memorizing or having notes for key points. Key points but, are specifics, though, because yeah. for, for her story, you have to remember specific phrases. Yeah. But I don't, I don't think you would agree with Matt. You don't memorize your, for your uh, five paragraphs of a word by you word. You know, I gotta say, sometimes when I hear Carmen speak, she's so polished, I wonder. I wonder if she's done the whole thing word for word. Think, think of it this way, the brain, how do we know what to do next? We do what, know what to do next in three ways. It's either reflexive, habitual, or goal-oriented. We know, by the way, how to not to touch that stove because of a reflex that's already memorized in our brain. We came, we were born with it. Habits, which sometimes include linguistic habits, are there because you have been practicing for so long. The motivational slogans that you heard in the keynote this morning came across college because they have been said a million times. So they come across as if they're memorized, but that's a speaker's habits. And then, yeah. Now, now Sally, yeah. in your podcasts, you have, you have an opportunity that, that maybe others don't in that you actually could script out quite a bit. When I, give, when I coach on webinars, I actually tell my clients it's okay to write out word for word your first paragraph, your ending, maybe some of your transitions. Do you ever do that and what do you feel about it? No, I don't on, on my podcast, but I am very planful and I just want to make a distinction between memorizing, because you're not memorized doesn't mean you don't prepare a lot. And so, there. in fact, I've, I've thrown out the word memorization when I work with my clients, and, it, and I've replaced it with the word integration. That your job as a speaker is to integrate your content fully into your body. Because I think we've all seen those speakers who are reading the script in their head and it's coming out mm -hmm. their mouth. Mm -hmm. And that that's we the, speak and that's the with danger. our body. That is the danger. Not authentic. And that's the, <laughs> the danger. That's the danger. That's the danger. Wait, wait, wait. Think about this way. So if we are talking about the brain and how we remember, whenever you're exposing your audiences to different stimulation, our brains build two memory traces. One is verbatim and one is gist. Verbatim, in order for people to remember exactly what you say, that means you have enough repetition where people remember those words precisely. Like if you were in my session yesterday, I was saying control your 10%. I want you to remember that verbatim. The other type of memory is gist, meaning that you're only getting your audiences kind of sort of remember what you said, but not fully. The difference between gist and verbatim from your audience's perspective is that gist will feel very good in the moment. So I don't really have to pay that much attention. I kind of get, I'm familiar with this. But later on, if they get the gist from you, and they get the gist from somewhere else, and they get the gist from somewhere else, you won't have any distinguishing factor. So some memorization has to happen for what you can consider people to remember verbatim, don't leave that to chance. I feel like there's something in between, and I call it rehearsing in my head. Rehearsing in your head? Because I will rarely write out everything and try to memorize it like an actor, but, but I will rehearse it in my head, and as I say it more often, I, I will own it. Yes. You know, I, I might own it word but for word. You don't, you're you don't this. rehearse out loud. <laughs> right. That's what we're all going to do. But you're having to rehearse out loud, right? That's, yeah. that's where it's going to be. We're having this conversation yeah, from our own perspective. We don't matter. None of us here matter. You matter. So if I ask a question, who cares how much we memorize? So that's, that's fine. Some of us memorize more than others. But what do you remember? What have you memorized from what we shared with you? And that's why I'm advocating that you must think from this angle of gist versus verbatim. If you ever failed a college test, it was because you showed up and you thought you knew verbatim, but you actually only knew gist. Have you ever done, or people that you know, not you. <laughs> gist versus verbatim, so think about what they should memorize. And sometimes in order to get to that answer, that means you must memorize more for yourself because you want to impact their memory with precision in some cases. I have to take it back. Picha Kucha, I rehearse that loud. Oh, yeah, so the shorter, you're so right, the shorter the amount of yeah. presentation, yeah, by the way, the more you have to memorize, because otherwise you won't be there. Well, yeah. and it's, it's all about the process of rehearsal. Yeah. How do you get to the point where you feel confident enough that you have mastery over your content, or that it is, in my words, integrated? Leah, you're going to take us home. So I have a, a really interesting example from my work about uh, authenticity and uh, memorization. So uh, we have a partner who is one of our, he actually is, Thank you. He actually is our best speaker. He's most requested. He speaks all over the world. And he, interestingly enough, has been giving pretty much the same presentation since the 90s. 
complete with the same PowerPoint slides. But because he has everything so memorized from doing it the same way, I mean, it's literally the jokes are exactly the same, but, it, but they have perfect cadence because he's been testing it out and it just it sounds super polished. And he calls himself the, the, the puppet or the trained monkey. He says, you know, you just get me up there, you pull the cord and off I go. You know, I don't even think about what I'm saying because I have it so memorized. But he says, my main job is to manage the energy in the room. Because since I'm not, since I'm not thinking about what I'm saying hardly at all, then my job is to kind of go around and facilitate and really get to really connect with the audience. So in that way, he actually comes across as more authentic because he's got the memorization down. Well, that's, that's, that's exactly why I had, had, for so many of my clients, had to pull them away from memorizing because it is getting in the way mm -hmm. of them connecting with their audience. All they're focused on is what I'm saying, what I'm saying, what mm -hmm. I'm saying, and not at all about what do they need, what's happening in the room right now. All right, Nolan's on in 12 minutes. So Ooh, we're going to let him go. Long. We're going to let all three of these go. Give it up for these three. <laughs> All right, our vendors will be happy to see you for the next 10 minutes.